Okay, so do you have any questions? Let's open this up for questions that you might have. Um, I have a question. Uh, we often say that, uh, we often call people non-Christians or unbelievers, but who are they? Those who don't attend church or those who just uh, non-Baptists or evangelists or charismatics, who are they? Okay, that's a, a good question because it's very fundamental to a lot of what we're talking about. Um, what do I mean when I use the word unbeliever or non-Christian? I'm going to go pretty much by my understanding of what the Bible says a true Christian is. That a true Christian is somebody who doesn't just say I'm a Christian. A true Christian is not somebody who just attends church regularly. But a true Christian is somebody who has a faith relationship in Jesus Christ. In other words, they have personally placed their faith in Jesus Christ, that he died for their sins, that he rose again, and that they desire to live with Christ. They desire to follow Christ. And so if they do, uh, if they become followers of Christ in this sense, they probably attend a church. Um, but uh, attending church doesn't make a person a Christian. Or attending a particular church, whether it's Baptist or Pentecostal or Orthodox or Catholic, that is not what makes a person a Christian. Um, Jesus said you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, Peter, when he preached to Jews who were God-fearing people, said you need to repent and be baptized. And so I believe that that personal faith is the key here. And, um, you know, it's been said that... Uh, Sleeping in a garage does not make a person an automobile. And so attending church merely does not make a person a Christian. Um, and so uh, I'm speaking of people who have not had that faith relationship to Jesus Christ, whether they attend church or not. Um, now, normally, we're talking about people who don't attend church at all, or maybe once a year at the most, or twice a year. Um, so that's my understanding, what I mean by that. And so it's not a matter of a particular denomination or uh, church that one attends. Other questions? Uh, while you were telling about third model of church planting, um, we have described many advantages of this model. So my question is, if it's so, why we could rarely see this model in the present days. So you're talking about the apostolic sort of model and why we so seldom see it. Well, actually it's probably more widespread than most of us in Western culture uh, know. I would suspect you've probably heard of the huge growth of the church in China. Uh, you know, estimates vary that uh, when uh, in the 19, early 50s, the communist government took over, there were probably two million Christians in China. And estimates now go anywhere from 60 to 100 million Christians in China. And m the vast majority of those are in house churches that are led by lay people. And these would be apostolic sort of church planters. Um, in India, many, many of the churches have been started this way. And so in many parts of the world, some of the, all the rapidly growing church planting movements that David Garrison describes in his books were where movements, for example, in Cambodia have grown from just a few churches to hundreds of churches in just a short amount of time. Uh, they're all using this apostolic method. So it's actually more common than we hear about. Our issue is usually the books that are being written and the models that most of us in Western culture, European culture, have heard of have been based on what we would call sort of a Christendom model of Christianity. In other words, you have a state church. It's assumed that everybody is more or less a Christian, everybody's been more or less baptized or confirmed into a church, whether that's Roman Catholic or Orthodox or Lutheran or Church of England. There's a sense that, well, everybody's kind of automatically a Christian because you were born into the church. And those churches are based on a parish system. The church already exists, and so we just need a pastor to care for the sheep in the flock. And so there's this pastoral role. And so that's just tended to be reproduced everywhere where churches get planted. And so that's why we've not really seen that model very much because 
until recently, we've kind of assumed, well, most of European culture is Christian, and we just, you know, we just need to care for the Christians, and so pastor Christians. Um, it's only really in, in the non-Christian world, in Asia, Latin America, uh, uh, Africa, where this more sort of apostolic model is developed, because you're, we're working in a world where there are not very many Christians, and people are just becoming Christians. So that, that's the main reason for this. But increasingly, we're realizing that even Western culture, which we've sort of assumed everybody's just kind of a Christian somehow, we're seeing that the, the culture is becoming what we call post-Christian. In other words, that many people may, may nominally say, well, yes, I, you know, I'm technically, I, I, I'm a Catholic, or I, technically I, I attend church once or twice a year, but people don't really believe. Many, many people are atheists, or the values are no longer Christian values. And so we talk about the whole culture becoming a post-Christian culture. At least there used to be Christian values in the society, understandings of marriage or, or sexual ethics or, or basic Christian values. But that now is less and less and less. And more and more people are leaving the churches. They said, well, you know, my family was always went to church, but why should I do that? I don't believe anymore. Just for the sake of tradition, I'm not going to go to church anymore. And so Western cultures are becoming less and less Christian and even though the great cathedrals may be still standing there, in places like Germany, many of the churches are being sold. Nobody's going to church. They can't afford to keep them up. And so uh, I, there was a recent article of churches that have been turned into restaurants or little shopping centers or community centers. People aren't going to church. And so we're finding out that even in Western culture, we need to engage Western culture like missionaries do. We can't assume that people are Christian. We can't assume they they have any understanding of the Bible. We can't assume that they have even the most basic Christian values anymore. And so the same way that the missionary used to engage Africa, where we knew, well, these people are not Christian. We're needing to look at European, in particular European cultures, in that way. Uh, that we need to engage them as a missionary would engage. These people are not Christian. The most atheist country in the world today is said to be the Czech Republic according to what people themselves say about themselves. And so here's a country that once would have been considered Christian, and now we have to engage in a very different way. And uh, so I think that's related to some of the reasons why this apostolic method is not practiced very often. I mean, there's many reasons. Many is that we have so many, uh, we have the expectation that a pastor always has to have a certain seminary education and a certain level of training. Well, it's not a bad thing. I teach at a seminary. But usually what happens is if a person says, well, I've gone through three, four, five years of, of training for ministry, I want to be paid. You know, I've invested in my education a lot of time, and so I, I deserve to be paid. And so it's very difficult to find people saying, I'm willing to be a tent maker. I'm willing to go where there is no church. I'm willing to go where there may not be anybody that's going to guarantee that I get paid every week. That, that requires commitment and sacrifice to do that. Um, and many times, unfortunately, when people have gone through a lot of training, they're not willing to do that. And so we fall back on that other model. So that was a long answer to your question, but it was, it's an important, important point. And this is why we need to learn from the church globally. We live in a day where um, there are Christians in all parts of the world. And the Church of Jesus Christ is taking all kinds of new expressions so whether they're house church movements or whether they're new ways of creative worship and new ways of evangelism, we can learn from a global church today. So we used to talk about missions being from the West to the rest. In other words, you had Western countries that were Christian countries and they would send the missionaries to the heathen somewhere in Asia or Africa. But now we're seeing that even there's so many believers in Africa, they're sending missionaries back to the West. And... Um, you know, there's a lot of good and bad things happening there too, but we can learn from a global church. And so things like how to plant churches, how to empower believers, we can learn those things. Any other questions? Uh, Dr. Ott, you use very interesting concept like calling a pastor. This concept would be quite strange for Russian evangelicals in Soviet Union time. We didn't have place to train people, only later on we had a school. But most of the time, pastors were grown up in the church. So what would you think in the future in the global 
trend in the mission, in the church movement, calling the pastors or growing the pastors? <laughs> well, that's a great question too, and it relates to the answer I just gave, that um, the model in the Western church has been largely a very professional model of ministry. And the same way a person would become a doctor or a lawyer, you know, you go to school, you go to university, you get a certain training, maybe you take tests to qualify you as a doctor or a lawyer, and then you, you have your professional practice. And we've taken that professional model in the Western church, uh, that many, if not most churches, have somebody who has a certain level of training and so on. And again, that's not a bad thing, but if that's the only way we look at ministry, it's gonna be very limited. And unfortunately, like you're saying, in places maybe like Russia, where it used to be that all the ministers were trained up within the church, locally, with, you know, you didn't have the option of sending somebody to a seminary or a Bible school. Uh, it would be a shame if you abandoned training up people in the local church uh, and only shifted over to a more professionalized model. Many of the churches did only have uh, bivocational pastors. It, it wasn't possible for somebody to be paid by a church. And it would be a shame if they shifted only now to a professional model. I think there's room for both. And I think that some of the kinds of things you're doing with this uh, TVS of making training, high quality training available to people in local churches so they don't have to leave and go away to school for years, but they can receive good training in their churches is a great way to combine and bring the best of both together. So in other words, strong training, but also locally based. Um, and so you're raising up leaders locally um, and you're not uh, looking around, well, where's a trained person we can call and bring in from the outside? So uh, you're bringing up a very important point. Okay, any other questions? These, these are great questions uh, because again, uh, so many churches are in transition today, especially uh, where new churches are emerging, say in Central Asia, or uh, where older churches are having to rethink, how do we do ministry? How do we reach the next generation? And uh, how do we maybe do our, our structure our churches different? How do we train our people differently? Um, like you say, there was great enthusiasm uh, after the uh, collapse of the socialist uh, system um, for Bible schools and professional training. It was something new, something available. It wasn't there before. But now the, the time is to say, well, let's evaluate that. Um, how does that really help our churches? How might it be hindering our churches? TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com.